If you guys weren't here last week or you didn't get the chance to listen to Public Enemy Number 1, uh, I, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. It's kind of the foundation for everything in the book of Jonah um, that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, but tonight is Jonah 2, fish food. That's, that's a really lighthearted you know, title because tonight's going to be really lighthearted. <laughs> Probably. Um, but uh, we'll, do, we'll do a quick recap, okay? And I say a quick recap on, uh, on last week. Because originally I had like two pages of recap and my editor was like, started calling me Captain Redundant and asked me if my arch nemesis was the patience of the people. (laughs) So yeah, let's do this. Okay, recap, quick recap. Jonah, Um, short book, right? It's only four really short chapters. And uh, the big part that we talked about last week was the overarching theme, and that's that the book of Jonah is not really about Jonah at all. It's a mirror, right? It's a mirror that we're supposed to look at ourselves, and we're supposed to ask ourselves two very important questions. Are you okay with God loving your enemies? And aren't you glad that God loves his enemies, which is us? right? Because if the answer to the second question is yes, which it should be, then your answer to the first question needs to also be yes, which is sometimes a little more difficult. Uh, Last week was pretty heavy. I got quite a bit of feedback that it was challenging. I was really challenged last week. Uh, Someone already told me tonight, hey, take it easy. You're a guest speaker. (laughs) Okay. So, Um, I'd like to say tonight's going to get a lot lighter and easier, but I don't want to spoil the surprise. Okay. Uh, so let's just, we're going to get into it. We skipped chapter two last week. It's a, it's a beautiful prayer from Jonah, but like so much of this book and like so much we talked about last week, there are so many layers to the book of Jonah, um, that the more you peel back, the more you find. And so tonight we are going to go on a little journey Uh, together through just one chapter of Jonah, and then we're going to see a whole lot of the rest of the Bible, because to really understand what's happening, we need to look at the whole picture. Um, So I'm I'm pretty excited. Let's let's pray. Can we pray together? Lord, lead us into truth. Lead us into the transforming power of your word. Lord, tonight, may your holiness overturn us from who we came in as to whom you call us to be when we leave. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get going. So uh, we, be, we begin, Jonah was thrown overboard by the sailors and as he sinks down into the dark waters, starting in Jonah 1.17, but the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish and it spewed Jonah out onto the dry land. This is uh, is quite the prayer, right? It's, um, especially when we compare it to Jonah's message to the Ninevites. We talked about that last week. You know, he's got this big message from God and he goes and does like the bare minimum. He preaches like a five word message to him. And so like when Jonah doesn't want to do something, he gives five words. But when it's like him in trouble, he becomes Shakespeare, (laughs) right? Like, and we we can identify this, right? Like if you're really hungry and you sit down to eat and you start digging in and it's always your child who's like, oh, we need to pray, dad. (laughs) And you're like so hungry and you're like, okay, good food, good eat, good God. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> good food, good meat, good God, let's eat, right? But when you like got to pray for like something you really care about, you're just like, Lord, 
maker of heaven and earth, the great physician, attend to your humble servant. And you just like wax eloquence, right? And you just go on and on and on and on, right? I know, I know you all know what I'm talking about, okay? There's actually like a big, there's a big debate um, among scholars, biblical scholars, that Jonah's prayer might be completely sarcastic. And so there's just some nuances there in the original language that they're like, is he, like, is he just being himself, you know, who we've come to, to recognize as Jonah, who's not really the greatest guy? Or is he actually be, being sincere? And we don't really know, so we're, gonna, we're just gonna take it at face value. We're just, gonna, we're just gonna see it as what it is, a prayer asking for deliverance, a change that's come over Jonah at that, that point of, of, of fear and terror and, and unsure of what's happening. He, he, he cries out. So where is Jonah? Jonah's eaten, right? He's in the belly of a fish. And what's interesting is that Jonah actually doesn't mention the fish. How does he describe where he is? It's hell, right? It's hell. He's describing it as hell. The belly of Sheol, the deep, the heart of the sea. How can I look upon your temple? I'm, I'm down below the roots of the mountains. I'm down in the land where the bars closed on me forever. I'm in the pit. This is the exact opposite of where Jonah was trying to go, right? Where was he trying to go when he fled from the Lord? He went down to Joppa first, okay? Joppa is like a coastal town in Israel. Joppa, the word means beautiful. It's not just like a clever name they gave it to try to get like tourists, okay? It was a nice, nice place, but it wasn't nice enough. So Jonah heads to Tarshish, the end of the world. And we know Tarshish from 1 Kings 10, where it talks about Solomon getting stuff from Tarshish, and he gets gold and ivory and silver and apes and peacocks. Like, I mentioned this last, last week, Tarshish was like the Fiji of the ancient world. It was like the nicest place on earth, okay? It was paradise. It was exotic and wonderful. It was full of valuable things. And so Jonah didn't flee to a cave to like live off of saltines and hard water, you know, he fled to comfort. He went to the beach. He fled to ease, to peace, and he found himself in hell. He found himself in the belly of a fish. That's, that's terrifying. Anyone here have thassalophobia after watching, you know, a lot of movies? I do. Gosh, the persistent fear of deep water, you know, the fear of getting eaten by a fish. No one else is afraid of that. I think that's, that's like a primal fear that exists in all of us. You know, it's one of these, one, like a generational fear. It's in your blood. It's like when you see a spider and you're like, Ugh. like it's an uncontrollable response, you know? Like it's been handed down since humanity first came across the water. Bless you. What's interesting is that when you look at like ancient beliefs and ancient people and belief structures, you will find this everywhere. Okay, you go back to any mythology and we understand that mythology was once called religion and belief, right? We go back to Egyptian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Sumerian and almost every other ancient people group and you'll find these like overarching belief systems that all look pretty similar. And in these beliefs, everything, all reality, I told you I was gonna take you on a journey tonight, right? This is just the beginning, okay? All reality starts with chaos. It starts with this chaotic water, this wild, roiling, deep, dark, terrible chaos. And somehow, out of this chaos, the gods are born, or the titans, or the forerunners of whatever faith we're talking about. And these gods eventually have to fight the chaos. They have to go up against it, they have to overcome it somehow, and sometimes they chop it up, and sometimes they spread it across the cosmos and build things out of it. But they can never fully kill it. They can't defeat it. Just like the sea is always there and evil is always coming from it. And there's always these evil agents of chaos when you look back at these, these old religions. The influence of this primordial evil, the BBEG, right? The big bad evil guys, okay? <laughs> and they had various names, Tiamat, Tanin, Jormungandr, Leviathan. They prowl around in the water. They have agents on the land and they're always just like lurking, lurking and causing death and destruction. And this was such an integral part of these cultures and these religions that a lot of their ceremonies and celebrations would involve battles against these, 
these monsters. And so every year or, or more than once a year, their king or their high priest would dress up as their, their strongest god and he would pantomime a fight with the monsters. And, it, and even if you weren't at a celebration, a storm rolls in, thunder and lightning. And, and this, is, this is a fight between our gods and the gods of chaos, the gods that are trying to take everything from us. This is, a, this is the battle of the titans right now when you saw a storm going on. It wasn't just a storm. It was something happening that was gonna affect us. And here was the thing, that sometimes the monsters won. Sometimes the gods were defeated. If you had a bad year, your crops failed, your kids died, someone came in and took over your country, it meant your God had lost. It meant that the chaos monsters had won. They had bested Ra and Tammuz and Marduk. And your only hope would be that maybe next year, if we pray enough, if we sacrifice enough, if we give our gods enough strength through our devotion, maybe they'll win and things can be okay again. And this is why the sailors were so afraid of this storm. It wasn't just a storm. They were caught in the middle of a fight between good and evil and they cry out to their gods saying, come on, win, win. And then Jonah rolls up and he's all like, oh yeah, my God made uh, the land. Oh, and he also made the sea. And they're like, whose God is that? What do we do? And they were, they were scared because they're floating on the chaos water right then and they're gonna die. Now, sometimes as enlightened and evolved Christians of the 21st century, who work really hard to find a balance between science and faith. We often read ancient religions and they're just funny, right? We kind of scoff about them. We read mythology for fun and uh, yeah, you know, we're like, geez, we know where lightning comes from. You know, and we're, we just kind of laugh at like how, how dumb these people were, at least how dumb we think they were. But before we think too highly of ourselves, what if I told you that our own belief system is not that different? There are multiple genres of literature in the Bible. It's not just one, one genre, right? There's epistles, prophecy, poetry, there's worship, there's historical narrative, there's wisdom, there's romance. Jonah alone has, has both poetry, and narrative, right? And did you know that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are written in a different genre than the rest of the book? The rest of the book is written as a historical narrative, but Genesis one through 11, based on how they're written and compared to other ancient writings, the genre of those 11 chapters fall under what we would call mythology. Now, before your hackles rise too far, all right, and uh, your idioms get poked too hard. I am not saying that they aren't true. I'm not saying those chapters aren't real, didn't happen, anything like that. What I'm saying is that there are similarities between these chapters and other ancient mythologies, and they're there for a reason. What does mythology do? It seeks to answer questions for which there are no answers, right? Where does evil come from? Where did reality come from? Why does it rain? Why are there different languages? What is the sun? Who's really in charge here? All ancient belief sought to answer these questions. We still seek to answer a lot of these questions, don't we? All ancient beliefs sought to find purpose and hope in the unknowable, and the Bible is the same. We have a tendency to try to push the Bible through the lens of modern science, which is always in flux, and the Bible isn't as concerned about it as we are. It's not a biology textbook. It's not a scientific treatise. It's a unified story that leads to Jesus. And everything that he did, every miracle, every word he spoke, rising from the dead, flies in the face of science. I love science. Don't, don't think I'm going against it, okay? I'm just trying to tell you. The key difference between Genesis and the other mythos is that the author actually knows the answers. And it's up to him when he decides and how he decides to reveal those. 
That's the first 11 chapters of Genesis. That's the purpose God is forming into this world, why the world is the way it is, and how his people are supposed to fit into that purpose. Here's the connection. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos. (gasps) (laughs) And darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. That sounds familiar. (laughs) Think about, just for a minute, think about this. When the Israelites, who had been steeped in Egyptian belief and religion all around them for 400 years, when they first heard this, when the Spirit of God began to work through Moses, and as he wrote the words of God, and as he began to share them with the Israelites about where they came from and what their purpose was. Imagine that you just came out of slavery for 400 years where every day you walked outside and the first thing you saw were statues of Ra and Isis and Horus, where the people who worshiped those gods brutalized you, killed your children, destroyed your life, put heavy work on you, made every moment miserable. How many generations worked enslaved under the pharaohs and thought, where is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He must be nothing compared to these gods because we wouldn't be here if he was. This is the belief structure that the Israelites faced, right? And God met them where they were, and he had to change their mindset of what creation was and what purpose was and showed them their place in it. And how does he start it? He shows up and he shows his power, making a mockery of the gods of Egypt, breaking their system, their religion, their country to the point where it is still never recovered. Thousands of years later, he swats them like bugs. He blocks out the sun. He turns the Nile to blood. He sends locusts. He sends sickness. He sends the plague. He sends bugs. He sends everything. He kills. He systematically destroys these Egyptian gods one by one from happy to Ra to Pharaoh. And Israel sees this. They see the devastation that Yahweh does and he sets them free from slavery and he stomps Egypt into the ground. And then in the wilderness, what did they learn? They learn why their God is so powerful because the very chaos the Egyptian gods were born out of, the very chaos they have to fight every year to have a good year, God made that. He made the chaos. And then with the word, he transformed it. And he brought purpose and life out of it. The BBEG is just a simple creation of Yahweh. It's like, it's like the last battle in Revelation. I used to think, like imagine it as like this just awesome, drawn out, like sword fight between good and evil and you're not sure who's gonna win until the last moment. That's not what happens. Every single evil being that's ever been is a raise against Christ and he walks out and says, yo, and it's over. That battle is half a second long. It's over. By the word of God, by simply his voice. On day three, God tells the waters, hey, get back. I got, I got to make some land over here. And the waters are like, okay. <laughs> right? On day five, on day five, he creates, it says he creates the great sea monsters. You guys see, he's the master over the chaos and all that's in it. How powerful would this have been to see the power of God and to understand this? And everywhere we go in the Bible where it talks about the sea or storms or monsters, we should be reminded of this because the Israelites would have been reminded of this. When they read Jonah, when they listened to it, when the storm rises up and the fish eats him, they would have thought of Genesis 1 and the unbelievable power of Yahweh. In the book of Job, God asked Job, hey, can you go fishing for Leviathan? And it's a, it's a rhetorical question because of course he can't, but the implication is that God can. That's like, a, that's like a Sunday morning fishing trip for God, okay? He fishes for the monsters of the sea. 
He might pull it up and be like, man, this one only wraps around the equator once. That's not good eating. I mean, like, that's the picture. In Psalm 104, it talks about Leviathan again, and it talks about how God made the sea for him to play in it. God's talking about this horrible, dragon-like, terrible monster, and he's like, look at that little guy. Little rascal. Splashing around, getting everybody all wet. I'm serious. Like, that's the picture here, okay? God is powerful. He is over the waters, Let's hyperlink, uh, let's hyperlink the New Testament. I told you, we're going on a tour of the Bible, you guys. Okay? But this is this, you'll see. You'll see where this is going, all right? Mark 6. Jesus feeds the 5,000, and uh, he sends the disciples on across the sea while he stays to pray, and a storm rises up. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. When he saw they were straining against the oars, at the oars, against an adverse wind. He came toward them early in the morning, walking on the sea. He intended to pass them by. Hmm. It's interesting. Matthew tells the same story, a little more detail. The disciples at first think he's a ghost, and they freak out. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come on. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately, I love this word here, he immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you have little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. I didn't understand this passage for a long, long time. Or the one in Mark 4 where like there's a storm and Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat and they're like, Jesus, save us. And he stands up and he's all like, hey, be muzzled. That's the words he used. That's the words. Shut up, okay? And it stops. The wind and the waves, they stop. And I used to read these and be like, that's cool. Wish I could do that. Wish I could walk on water. Who here has tried besides me? Raise your hands, people. I know you have. (laughs) Okay, we've all tried it. Some of us probably still do. But what I finally realized is that these moments are maybe the greatest pre-resurrection proof that Jesus is God. It certainly was evidence for the disciples. When we examine these stories in light of Genesis 1, Jesus has the same power over the sea, over the chaos. In Mark it says this, He intended to pass them by. What's he doing? He's out there. Like he was in the beginning. Walking on the waters. Stomping monsters. Showing the disciples in a picture that they would absolutely had cultural and historical context for that he was I am. He was the Lord. When he rebuked the storm, and it stopped, it was because the chaos waters heard their master's call. They recognized that voice. It was the same voice that in the beginning brought purpose out of them. And they shut up. And then Peter tells Jesus, I want in. I want to do what you do. I want in on this. I want to... I want to walk on this water. I want to to have power over this water. And Jesus is like, come on. Yeah, let's go. And Peter starts it out, you know, and it's working. It's like, oh my gosh, it's working. (laughs) And then the wind and the waves are still going and he's afraid and he starts to sink and Jesus immediately grabs him and is like, it's okay, Pete. Don't doubt. We got this. It's almost... When I think about Peter going under and coming back up, it's like a baptism. You submerge and Jesus draws you out. And I think that's a fitting parallel for what we see happening to Jonah. We've talked about sea monsters tonight, right? So what word does the author of Jonah use for the great beast that swallows Jonah? Is it Leviathan? Is it the Hebrew word for whale? We kind of like that, right? Now, anytime you think of Jonah, you think of Jonah and the whale. And we like that because we don't really know of a fish big enough to eat Jonah where 
a person could actually live inside their stomach for three days. And so we're like, whale would probably be close, right? We're trying to fit the Bible through that like keyhole again, make it make sense. So the Hebrew word used is dagadol. You, you hear that and you're like, whoa. That's like a Lord of the Rings dragon name right there. This, this thing has got to be awesome. Okay, Dagadol. Well, that's how you spell dog in Hebrew. And this is what it means. Fish. <laughs> means fish. Dagadol means huge fish. Okay. Man, we wanted a sea monster. We wanted like the Megalodon or the Kraken or something, right? Like give us something cool. No, it's just a big fish. What kind of fish? I don't know. Big one. Still splashing around somewhere? I don't know, right? Did God simply make it for this very purpose? Man, God can make anything he wants. God can make some big weird beast and tell it to do something. Okay, he can make a big old fish. What's really awesome about this, and I didn't just bring this up to be funny, okay, what's really cool is that in 117, the word is dog, and in 210, it's dogga. And dog is the masculine form of the noun fish, and dagga is the feminine form of the word fish, because Hebrew had like many other languages, masculine and feminine forms of nouns. And we know that the Bible's inerrant, which means without error, and so we know that's not a typo. That was on purpose. Why did the fish change in the, in the course of one chapter? Why is that? Why is it now a female fish? The author's obviously trying to communicate with us. He's trying to give us a picture, right? Jonah went into the water as a crooked little dude who's trying to run from God and rebel against him. And something happens inside. And I don't know, but if I found myself inside of a fish stomach and I wasn't dead, I certainly still wouldn't be alive, right? You're somewhere in the middle here. And, and Jonah's poem is kind of like that. He's taught, like the picture there is that he's somewhere between living and dead. Can you imagine like the discomfort of being in the bowels of this, of this fish? The fear, the anxiety, the claustrophobia. Neither alive nor dead. He's like Schrodinger's prophet, okay? But in that time, something begins to happen to Jonah. He surrenders, right? There's an overturning of what he wants to do. This, this rebellious prophet starts calling out, I called to the Lord out of, my, out of my distress. You brought my life up from the pit. You heard my voice. My prayer came to you. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Jonah doesn't have a stellar beginning and certainly not a stellar end, but his prayer seems genuine. And in this moment when he finally gives in, the picture is not so much that he's just vomited out, but that he is birthed out. He's undergoing a transformation and something has changed, right? Deliverance belongs to the Lord. What is the word we use when we have a baby? Delivered. Right? Jonah went into the water and he came back out like a baptism, like a new birth. Jesus talks about the sign of Jonah in Matthew 12. The Pharisees are grilling him like they like to do. And they're like, hey, give us a sign, Jesus. Give us a sign. And he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, straight out of Deuteronomy, but no sign will be given to it. Well, except for the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah and indeed something greater than Jonah is here. Nineveh repented, but you won't. Jesus doesn't call it a fish. He calls it a sea monster. And he's not negating fish, but he's talking about what the fish represents, which is death. He's telling the Pharisees that just like Jonah went into the water to be eaten by the fish, they are gonna send him, they are gonna feed him 
to the monster. They're gonna feed him to death. What is deeper in the sea than the belly of a fish? What's deeper in the earth than the grave? Except, this is Jesus. And this is like his Obi-Wan Kenobi moment. Strike me down and I'll become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Feed me to the monster. Feed me to death. I'm gonna kill it. You're gonna kill me and that vehicle of death will become the path to eternal life. Just like Jonah was born again from the fish, I will come back so unstoppable that all who call on my name will also be born again. That is the message of Jonah chapter two. If you follow the Lord, the path of death leads to life. Now what do we do with this? We took a little tour, right? We took a journey just now through ancient mythologies, our own belief system, sea monsters walking on water, baptism, a big fish becoming your spiritual godmother. Like it was quite the trip. But now, now what do we do? Like what do we do with this download we just got of information? Let me ask you, what are you afraid of? What do you fear? Pain, sickness, going hungry losing, losing loved ones, losing arguments, losing faith. What are we most afraid of? Death. Death is what we are most afraid of, right? Who is the real evil guy? Satan. And what is his ultimate weapon? It's death. It's the thing that takes everything from us. It's the ever-present reality of our daily lives. Our culture, our world lives in constant fear of death. And what is our solution? What's the world's solution? We avoid it. We flee from it. We try to ignore it. We seek to surround ourselves with comfort, riches, influence, a legacy that out, will outlive us. And really, if we're really being honest, our goal is to become so wealthy or so famous or so fill in the blank, that we don't really have to worry about anything anymore. That we're safe, that we're in control. But death will always come. It's always there, just like the sea is always there. You know, people are trying to like cryogenically freeze themselves right now. There's like 500 people around the globe that like froze themselves so when the cure for death is found, they can get unthawed and like live forever. That's wild because there is no cure for death, except one. <laughs> I went to a presentation once. It was at the, uh, the Golden Corral. I don't know if there's Golden Corrals anymore, but it used to be an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? And I was like 23 years old, and they had this thing where it's like, hey, come listen to this spiel, and you can get free food. And what 23-year-old would not jump on that as fast as they could, right? So I go there and I'm like eating my surf and turf and it's a good day and I'm listening to this dude try to sell me a mattress. <laughs> and it, the selling point of this mattress is that it's lined with like these copper panels. And these copper panels will improve your circulation so much that they will, you'll live like an extra six months to a couple years. And I'm like laughing, you know, I'm like this is ridiculous. I'm like, who's, who's thinking about it? Who's buying this, you know? And I'm looking around, kind of like seeing who else is laughing, and no one else is laughing. <laughs> and I realize, there's no one else my age here. <laughs> Everyone here is at least half a century older than I am. And every single one of them was hanging on this dude's every word like it was the last life preserver on the Titanic. I mean, they were just like like the desperation in their eyes. They're like, yeah, we're gonna live. Six more months, yeah, how much, how much is it? And I think this mattress cost like 10 grand. But as I'm looking around at these people, it wouldn't have mattered if it was 100 grand. There was no price that these people wouldn't pay to live six more months. That dude probably retired after that spiel because every single person there bought one of those mattresses except one who couldn't have afforded it. How hard do we work to avoid death? Oh man, we work hard. And not, I'm not even talking about just like ultimate death, final death. I'm talking about like the little deaths, the little things that hurt our pride, they cost us. They make us give up the things we want or the things we wanna do, 
right? These things are uncomfortable, and we have prioritized comfort to the point that being uncomfortable is basically a little death. Like Jonah on the hill, when God kills his little shade vine, he gets hot. How many of you got hot today? Yeah. Jonah got hot and he was like, God, kill me. Take my life. Okay? And how often do we do this? Sunday morning, you come to church, you're worshiping, you're like, oh, worship's so good. The message is so good. Fellowship is so good. God, you're so good. And then you go out to eat and they don't have hot wings and you're like, do you even love me? Are you even real, Lord? You've been there. I know. How hard do we work to avoid being uncomfortable? To avoid being hungry, to avoid being challenged, to avoid people who disagree with us, to avoid self-discipline. We have become no different than the world's culture. We have fully embraced the all-consuming quest for comfort. We are like Jonah. And when we have to do something that might cost us a little bit, that might make us die to ourselves, we run. And we don't run to some cave somewhere. We run to paradise. We run to Tarshish. We surround ourselves with safety and security and plans that we make with our own hands. We are so desperate to live without any troubles, without any fears, especially the fear of death. And our enemy knows this. This is part of his plan to make us fear sacrifice above all to make us fear persecution and pain and discomfort. He puts us in this weird place where we fear death and the reason we fear it is because death will separate us from all that comfort we worked for, all that safety we worked for, all the structure, all the control of our own destiny that we are working towards. When we look back at Christians through history, you know the fastest way to make more Christians? Start persecuting the ones that are already there. That is, it's crazy. It's this upside down reality that a Christian who is so in love with Jesus that they are unafraid of death and persecution, like that knows that they will take nothing with them when they die and so they don't fear that death. When other people see that love and devotion, the kingdom explodes. And Satan understands that reality. He figured it out. Like Pastor Dave said on Sunday, he's clever, right? The enemy's not an idiot. He saw this pattern. And so he knows that all he has to do is keep us scared and comfortable. He just has to convince us to keep ourselves safe. If we can just stockpile enough food, enough rain barrels, enough ammunition, enough gold bars in our little off-grid paradise, enough toys, enough money, enough of the good life of this world, we will grab it like it's a copper-lined mattress and we will not let go of that. We will fight God himself to preserve that. We are so desperate to live eternal lives of comfort that we are actually dying slow, ineffectual deaths of uselessness. We face a little death, a little chance to put someone ahead of us, to let someone else win, to walk away, to do something uncomfortable, to forgive those who hurt us. Instead of dying a little, we will double down on comfort. And when we do that, we make our testimony impotent. This is the culture. This is what become of our culture. The culture of Jonah, we do what we want to do. We seek justification for how we feel and we act even when it's wrong because it's easy. It's easy. You know, we love free will, right? We're like, man, I can do anything I want. God gave me this gift of free will. Yeah, but you know what? God stacks the deck a lot. A lot, okay? Look at all the decisions you could have made to destroy your life, and God didn't let you make those. Yeah, you could have chosen the other way if you're an idiot. And in spite of my own idiocy, God still helped me, okay? If God hadn't stacked the deck against Noah's free will and really heavily handed sent him to Nineveh, what would have happened? One of two things. 120,000 people would have been lost forever or God would have sent someone else. 
Someone who put his kingdom before their own comfort. And that might not sound too bad. How many of you have been in a position where God's been like, you need to go do this, and you're like, God, send someone else? Please. Let me tell you something that Jonah learned. He learned this, that the path of comfort leads to hell. So when you say, God, send someone else because I just want to stay here. I just, I just do, I want to do what I want to do. I don't like that. I don't like doing that. I, that's not my spiritual gift, okay? <laughs> right? The path of comfort leads to hell. And often we find ourselves there, right? And when we do, we cry out, just like Jonah, and we're like, God, deliver us. I'm so sorry. I'll do anything you want. I'll look again upon your holy temple. And God, in his great mercy, delivers us. And we're like, no. I'm just going to go back to being what I was. Delivered, but unchanged. Do we not realize that Jesus meant what he said when he said those who want to save their life will lose it and those who lose their life for my sake will find it? Yeah, I think there's multiple layers of death that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about final death and he's talking about little deaths. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Dave said this statement that I absolutely love. Church is supposed to kill you. And what that means is this, is that as we walk with Jesus together, we are gonna be faced with opportunities to die to ourselves in church much more than in the world. As iron sharpens iron, Iron gets lost. It gets shaved off. It becomes trash. Parts of us die, and it hurts. It hurts a little to crawl up on the altar. It hurts to do the thing you would rather not do. Forgive, reconcile, serve, give your time, give your tithe, help people. These things are hard because it's a little death, and little death means discomfort, and discomfort is counterculture. Well, guess what else is supposed to be counterculture? Us. The church is always supposed to have been counterculture because when the church is indistinguishable from the culture that's around it, it's not church, it's a club that's playing at following Jesus. So what do we do? What do we do? Do we be like Jonah? Doing the bare minimum to barely fulfill what God asks us? Climb up to the hills, leave the world behind, sit in safety and watch it burn? Jonah got out of the boat to run from God. Peter got out of the boat to run to God. In spite of the wind and waves, in spite of the monsters, in spite of the possibility that it might not work, he got out of the boat. He leapt into the chaos waters because when you love Jesus, fear and death cannot stop you. Don't you guys know that for those of us in Christ, when death comes for you and it's coming, you're just going home. You're just going to that place that your soul has longed for since it first met Jesus, man. You're going home. The enemy will take everything from you. He will kill us all, but that's all he can do. All he can take is this life, and it's the parts that can't go with you anyway. Your flesh, your possessions, your sickness, your sin, let him have it. Take it. Because the real you, the child of God, whom he loved and died for, that you can never belong to the enemy. In the 50s, uh, there was a group of five missionaries and their families who went down to Ecuador. We probably all know who they are, Steve Saint, Jim Elliott, um, to name a few. And they go down there and they have this like burning desire to reach this tribe that no one has ever reached with the gospel. And this is a pretty famous story. They made at least one movie about it. There's been books written about it. And they go and they meet this tribe and these five guys Fathers, husbands, sons, they get speared to death by the, the very people they were going to save. And before he died, Jim Elliot wrote this in his journal. He wrote, 
He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. This is the call for us, church. We have to realize that our lives are no longer ours. Why should we expect to do anything less than what our king did for us? How can we expect to live a life of ease, of comfort? We must begin to understand that following Jesus is a death sentence. Just as him loving us was his death sentence. Those five missionaries, I think this is a really difficult truth sometimes. Those five missionaries, who put the call in their heart to go there? God did. Who knew what was gonna happen when they went there? God did. God called those five men to go to Ecuador and die for his kingdom, for his purpose. He called them because he knew that their love for him was greater than their fear of death. And their blood spilled on the side of that river made a bridge to save an entire people group who otherwise would have been lost for eternity. The blood of those five men cried out and in true kingdom of God fashion, it wasn't for vengeance, but for grace and life. That should be the call we desire. Our lives should look like this. Be thankful for what you have. Love your life. Take care of your family. Protect those who've been entrusted to you. But always remember that all of that can be taken away. In fact, all of that is in the enemy's crosshairs. And he's waiting for an opportune moment to pull the trigger. Deep down, what matters most in your life is Christ. The one that we can never be separated from except by our own choice. And so we need to cry out, send me home, Lord. Call me out of the boat. Feed me to the fish. Baptize me in the storm. Lead me into the small deaths so I can live a life worthy of dying for your name. Let me be Peter, not Jonah, on the water, in the water, under the water. I don't care as long as I'm with you. I want to finish with this, this little story. Um, a while ago, we had a, a SWAT call out and we had to go apprehend a man uh, who had shot at us, tried to kill some of our officers. And uh, he was barricaded, he wouldn't surrender. And we tried all the peaceful resolutions like we always do to get this man to surrender and he wouldn't. And there came a moment where we just had to go get him. And we're walking down towards this guy. And we have this big ballistic shield because he'd already shot at us. He tried to kill us. He's armed. He's dangerous. And there came a moment where, where I was in the stack and what my job was and what my part of the plan was to apprehend this man, where I was going to be exposed to this guy. And I was afraid. And as I'm sitting there and I'm getting ready to, to put myself out from behind the shield so I could do my job. My mind said, this is it. And I knew that I was going to take a bullet. And the only part of me that was uncovered that wasn't protected was my face. And I was like, I'm going to get shot in the face and I'm going to die. And as that fear started to really take over me, man, the hand of Jesus just plunged through the surface into my heart. And I was filled with peace and it wasn't because he said, you're not gonna get shot. He didn't say that. He didn't say, it's all gonna be okay. He didn't say that. He simply said, look where you are. And where I was standing, I realized that behind me was one of my, my coworkers, my teammates, my friends whom I deeply love. And he doesn't know Jesus. And Jesus said, look where you are. And I realized that if this bad guy opened fire on us, yeah, I was gonna die. But this guy would live. And he would have one more day to know Jesus. And I knew that in that moment of life and death, that I was exactly where Jesus had called me to be, standing between death 
and someone who doesn't know him yet. And this is where, this is where we gotta be. We have to be willing to take the vehicle of discomfort and death and let it lead us to life because for a Christian, it always will. The little death will lead to more life and the final death will lead to a life that we can't even imagine. You guys, this is so hard. Some days I can do this and some days I can't, but I pray that God will help me eschew comfort, deny myself the easy road, and embrace the path of sacrifice that he took for me. Let's pray. Send us home, Lord. Call us out of the boat. Feed us to the fish, God. Baptize us in the storm. Lead us to small deaths so that we can live lives worthy of dying for your name. Let us not be satisfied with, with comfort or riches or anything that we have that is transitory. But God, let us be like Peter and let us be on the water or in the water or under the water. Let us be with you wherever and be satisfied that you're there. Lord, help us to embrace the path of sacrifice that you took for us. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.